Welcome back to season three of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing people who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. If that sounds like you, reach out. We can talk about having you on the show, too. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal. You can find the links to either option in the podcast description. As always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Welcome back to the podcast. I have an incredible guest with me today, Dr. Ann Katona Lynn. She is a, an educational coach, a speaker, an author, a leader across the United States, and she's dedicated her career to helping schools and communities develop safe, supportive, and positive environments. But she did this because she learned from her own personal experience with childhood adversity and trauma. And you know, that's what here is overcoming the past to have a better life. She's definitely done that. And I'm super excited to have her with us. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lynn. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I am excited to get to know you. You have had um, quite the adventures. You traveled across the country doing what what it is that you do. You've helped countless people. Um, But where are you originally from? So I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and I actually live now back where I was, um, where I grew up. I I, I did move around for a bit and ended up back uh, 15 minutes from where I grew up. So central Pennsylvania, kind of a small town, um, but just great place to grow up. I've been there. I used to be a flight attendant. I've oh. been to Pennsylvania and it's just absolutely gorgeous. I don't blame you for going back. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I missed it until I moved away and lived in other places. And I was like, wow, Pennsylvania is really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it really is. Yeah. So what kind of uh, early childhood trauma did you have to overcome that eventually kind of led you down this path? Yeah. So I, when I was four years old, the, the, the main trauma um, was a car accident. And I remember all of the details. And so my family was in a car going to, uh, take something to my sister who was in nursing school. And it was about an hour and a half to two hours away from where we lived. And it was, you know, I was all excited. I remember I had my little like sailor outfit that I was wearing, you know, I just, I remember all these things. I'm literally tomorrow is my birthday. I will be 57 and I can <gasps> still remember all of these things. So it's kind of crazy. Well, um, happy birthday a little early. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> but it just kind of shows you how trauma sticks to, you know, really sticks. But right. as uh, you know, we were in the car, this was 1970. They didn't have car safety laws. There were no car seats. Cars didn't even have seat belts. And in fact, they had you know, the, the bench seats. And so, uh, it was my dad driving my sister. One of my sisters was in the middle and then my mom was in the passenger seat and I was in the back and I was napping and, uh, it, there was a thunderstorm. And so I got a little bit of a, I was afraid and I went up and sat on my mom's lap and there was a lot of traffic and there, there was, it was storming at the time and that car in front of us I hit into the back, we hit into the back of this car and I went face first through the windshield. Oh yeah. A little four-year-old missile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have grant, we have grandkids and it just is mind blowing to think how difficult that was for my family to see. And, and just, Oh, I can't even imagine, you know, what you had to be a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember them taking me out of the car and then driving to the hospital and my mom, there was a state police uh, who was off duty. He actually stopped and took us, he ended up taking us to the hospital and gave him, gave my mom his shirt 
off his back and put uh, really had to hold my face where it was re- bleeding the most. And I remember saying to her, like, please, that hurts. Don't push so hard. And she's like, I have to, so you don't bleed more, you know? And then, you know, taking me into the hospital, uh, I remember them pulling me away from my family and, and getting me ready for surgery. Cause they had to, you know, really get in there right away. And, uh, and then after having plastic surgery with 77 stitches in my face, uh, they wouldn't allow family to stay with you. So I was in the hospital four years old for an entire week by myself. Uh, and they were only able to come visit during visiting hours. So that was two hours a day. And then they would uh, distract us with these little red wagons that they would drive us around the hospital so that our families could sneak out. So oh. that was every day, you know, and my dad had to go home. I'm the youngest of seven and my dad had to go home and take care of the rest of the kids. And then my oldest sister who was in nursing school and my mom, my mom stayed and the two of them would come and visit me and have to leave. And, and I didn't know until I was an adult, but when they would go down in the lobby, they would just cry because they just were heartbroken having to leave me, you know, but this was hospital policy back then. Wow. So, I mean, it was traumatic for you to have to go through the wreck, but then also the separation from your family at such a young age. And then also traumatic for your family because they're Mm -hmm. separated from their little bitty. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they felt helpless, you know, didn't know what to do. So, yeah. So that was, you know, that trauma, trauma. And then when I got home, we didn't talk about things, you know, it was 1970. Mm -hmm. We just didn't talk about it. So that kind of led to further just untreated trauma so yeah absolutely i'm looking at your your photo here and your plastic surgeons have done an incredible job because you're a beautiful person and i don't see a bunch of scars or anything from a traumatic accident thank you yeah they they did a very good job and you know they've they're i can see them though they're just they've been a part of my you know my looks for so long that I, I don't even notice, you know, I don't notice them and most people don't, you know, they're easy to, easy to cover up with makeup. And even if I don't wear makeup, they're still minimal. So yeah, they did a really good job. Yeah, they really did. It's amazing. Thank you. And plastic surgery is such a, a useful tool in traumatic situations like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, you know, that would have been a, would have been further trauma if I really had, you know, kind of disfigurement from the whole situation. So, yeah, absolutely. But how does the childhood trauma that you've experienced, how has this had lasting effects for you throughout your life? Yeah. So, you know, with the fact that it wasn't treated at the time, uh, that really, I, I ended up with full blown PTSD. So I had panic attacks specifically related to the car accident. So one of them were thunderstorms. I was like a little weather girl that I would know when a thunderstorm was coming because I had to be with, you know, one of my safe people. So my mom and my two oldest sisters were my safe people. And so I knew exactly what was going on and, and I wouldn't go to situations where I would be away from them during the summer months when there was a possibility for thunderstorm. I was better the rest of the time, but that I I really had a lot of abandonment issues. And, uh, and then, you know, anytime I remember I was in probably second grade, I, uh, we had to stay after school because we did something, you know, something that the class did, we all had to stay after school and it was only probably 10 minutes. But the fact that I, I would, you know, normally have to go and walk about two blocks away to where my mom was working. She was uh, working in a library. And after school, I would always go to go there to meet her. And so this 10 or 15 minutes that they kept us after school, I had a full blown panic attack because I was freaking out thinking my mom was going to leave me because I was not there on time, you know? So any kind of situation that, that um, where I felt like people were going to leave me was uh, traumatic and then being in a car where uh, I was not comfortable with the person driving. So my poor sister, who's the next up for me, she's actually eight years older than me. She was getting her driver's license and she had her permit 
and my mom pulled over on the side of the road. I was eight years old at the time. And my sister, she was going to let my mom, my sister drive. And I got out of the car and was walking down the road because there was no way I was going to be in a car with a new driver. It was not wow. going to happen. So, uh, you know, so all of those things just impacted me for my entire childhood. And then uh, around 14, actually, I realized that the panic attacks stopped. And at a later time in my life, I figured out that I was really, I start, that's when I started drinking. And so I was self-medicating and I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. So that further, you know, obviously I wasn't dysfunctional with drinking though. It just calmed my symptoms enough so that I never, I didn't actually, I thought I was over it. Um, right. and, you know, I was also just very insecure I, uh, I just felt like something was wrong with me and that people were going to leave me and, and they didn't want me. So I was very, very needy, um, uh, in relationships really kind of clingy and, uh, just, just really had those abandonment issues. And I think part of that, uh, I was also raped in my early twenties. And I think that my previous trauma didn't, I didn't, it didn't um, cause me, you know, it, I don't blame myself for the rape, though I did at times because it was somebody I had dated previously. Mm -hmm. uh, I even filed a police report, but I didn't press charges because I didn't, I didn't feel like I had any support and I didn't trust that people would take care of me. So that was, that was kind of another big piece. I had a lot of trust issues. I always felt like I had to prove that there's nothing wrong with me. And that I had to prove myself and be successful so that people wouldn't leave me. So, and, and I, I didn't want to ever be a bother to people either. So those wow. are kind of some of the big things that I would say impacted how it impacted me. So, oh yeah. Yeah. And the self-medication thing, I think there's a lot of trauma survivors that can, that can identify with uh, turning to alcohol to try to numb the pain a little bit and thinking that it's helping. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what did you do to start uh, developing coping mechanisms that were actually healthy to get you away from having to deal with trauma brain? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the good things was just, I was extremely physically active and mm -hmm. I, you know, I did sports. I was, I was good at sports. I didn't do one specific sport. I just, I, like I ran, I played basketball um, I was a swimmer and a diver and I was a cheerleader even through my childhood. And so I did a variety. And then as I got older, I did marathons and triathlons. And, um, my husband and I actually do stand up paddling on whitewater now. <laughs> so, you know, kind of that protective factor of always being athletic and always being into sports has, uh, been very good for my healing. Again, I didn't realize it necessarily at the time, but it was always a positive. And then, um, I went, I probably was, it was in my early thirties and I just felt like I, I was, you know, I wasn't married and I really just felt like I needed to have a change in my life because what, what I was doing wasn't working. I felt like I was really missing something. So I ended up going to a singles retreat. Um, it was a Christian retreat and, during that time, we did a, an activity where I would either write a letter to somebody who I would, who I would forgive or write a letter to someone else or to God asking for forgiveness for something that I did. And I remember during this activity, I just, you know, I asked for forgiveness for myself and I forgave someone else in a past relationship. And I just bawled, I bawled, bawled, bawled. Like I went through a whole box of tissues. You know, I kind of laugh when I think about that, that situation. Cause I was like, wow, I don't know if I cried that much ever in my life. And I was really, I, I, I let it go. And so, uh, so that I kind of decided that, you know, after that, that I was going to make some changes in my life. And I was really almost curious. I still didn't see alcohol as being, a major issue. I mean, I thought it was somewhat, but I just decided I was going to quit drinking. So I stopped drinking 
and all of a sudden started having panic attacks and didn't really know what that was. Uh, you know, I'm like, what the heck's going on? Uh, you know, and as I was just, I was really healing and doing a lot of healing in that time. I was meditating. I was going to church more often. I was, um, you know, studying and really, really focusing. And I also decided that I was going to become celibate too. So all of those things, it was kind of a major shift. Those things really kind of changed how I looked at myself. So I didn't see myself as broken. You know, I was, yes, damaged, but I didn't look at it. It was more of, I saw that I had been through a lot. And, uh, you know, I, when I first got the panic attacks, I remember saying to God, like, what's going on here? And he's like, you have tried to heal on your own your entire life. Now it's time to heal with my help and professional help. Like it was so crystal clear that I could still repeat it. Like that's what I, you know, I got. And so uh, that was really, and, and, and at this point too, you know, kind of in this entire process of making these changes in my life, I felt like I was actually worthy to move back home. And so I ended up moving back home because before that, I just felt like I wasn't good enough for my family. And, you know, and, and I think that came from me feeling like they abandoned me. So all of those things, though, um, you know, so moving back home and uh, I was getting my master's and really focusing on healing myself and getting, you know, counseling. And I was the first time I started medication for anxiety and just, you know, continued. I was doing triathlons and I was eating really healthy and I, all of those things together just really kind of accelerated my healing. You know, it was the beginning uh, and I, and I was single for seven years. I didn't date at all. And though that's what I needed because I just continued to get in bad relationships. And so having that time where I was really focused on my own wellness and healing before I actually got into another relationship was definitely the best thing that I could have done. So absolutely. How long after that did you meet your husband? So I met my husband actually, uh, seven, really kind of seven years after that initial breakthrough. And when I started really that healing and I, uh, I start, I decided to actually move back home, home because I got a job in Harrisburg, which was about an hour and a half commute from where I was living. And I was living in the Lehigh Valley, kind of the Eastern part of Pennsylvania. And I had a house and just, I was doing really well and ended up getting this job and was working in the central part of Pennsylvania. And my sister had bought a house close by and I was like, Oh, I'm, you know, that's, I can do that. I can live there again. And my mom was there and, you know, some other family, you know, other family members and uh, all lived in this area. And so I moved back, you know, really seven years, six years after I moved to Pennsylvania again in the first place. And then uh, actually the, the day after, well, a week before I moved into the house that I'm currently in, which is now where my husband and I both live, I had, uh, cause I met my husband on match.com. I was like, yeah, just kind of curious to see what's <laughs> out there, see how it goes. You know, maybe, maybe I can meet some new friends in the area. And he was actually my first date on match.com. So the first date after seven years of no dating, and he always jokes, he's like, he's like, well, I'm better than nothing. And, and so he <laughs> said to him, he's like, no, if you can get a single woman who is perfectly happy being single to go out on a date with you, that's gold. Like, so he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know? <laughs> So yes. <laughs> that so, is a beautiful yeah. way to look at it. <laughs> oh yeah. So it was our, you know, he was the first date that I'd had. And we talked on the phone for two weeks before we actually even, you know, went on a first date because I was moving in. I was in the process of moving into this house where I am. And, you know, it, it, there was no history in this house for me. You know, he had a house that he eventually ended up selling and moving in here. 
you know, because it, it was kind of like we met and I moved in here. There was no history. So it was kind of easy for him. And his kids are like, oh, yeah, you got to you got to go there, you know, because <laughs> there was a pool and, you know, not lots of property. And so, uh, yeah, so we met pretty pretty quickly after I moved back home home. So I felt like, you know, it was meant to be that I needed to go through that process before I actually was in a relationship that was going to be more of what I deserved and being in a relationship with somebody who was good for me. And we now actually, the end of this month will be our 17th anniversary of our first date. So, oh my goodness. Um, yeah. So that is so cool. Yeah. So you, we, we've been together. Yeah. For that long. So my gosh. And right off the bat, and, and yeah. I have a similar story with my husband. So I, you know, being a survivor of human trafficking, I came through all of that and was trying to navigate my way in life for a long time and kind of floundering. Yeah. And when I finally got through counseling and then I wrote my autobiography um, in April of 2021, was my baptism in June of 2021, June 19th was the day that my autobiography was published on my 10 year anniversary of freedom. And then the very next month is when I met my husband. Wow. <laughs> you do. Oh my goodness. No wonder we connected. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you do everything that God's telling you to do kind of happens that way, it seems. It's very true. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned something earlier about when you were able to forgive somebody, it sounds like they were not there. They weren't anywhere near you at the time. A lot of people don't fully understand what forgiveness means. Can you maybe elaborate on what it is? Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, it was an activity. Like I said, we were writing letters and this person, we were not together. I hadn't communicated with them in any shape or form. And really, I just wrote a letter, you know, saying how I've been forgiven. You know, I talked about God forgiving me, you know, that first letter that I wrote asking God for forgiveness and that, you know, I was forgiving him and I was basically releasing him and just encouraging him to, you know, turn to God and because he can forgive him as well, you know, that God can forgive him as well. And just kind of shared a little bit about my journey, just about how I feel so free. So yeah, that forgiveness is, is really about me letting go of that person uh, and not letting what they did to me impact me and define me anymore. You know, I, I needed to focus on myself and doing what was best for me and me letting them go whether I actually, and I did send the letter to him um, and he was going through his own spiritual awakening at that time as well. <laughs> Though, wow. Yeah. So it was kind of really interesting. And, you know, but even if he didn't respond in any shape or form, and we had no communication at all after that, I, the fact of me letting go and just writing it down and kind of taking it off my plate and really giving it to God, it, that's the forgiveness that freed me, you know, like me asking for forgiveness and me just really letting go of the power that somebody else had over me was that's, that's the forgiveness. It's giving up me trying to take the poison that I'm wanting for them, you yeah. know, and wishing them good. Like here, I, you know, I wish you a good life. I don't, you know, it is, we, we try to hold on to things thinking that it's going to help us. And it really is only hurting us, you know, and it's not hurting the other person. So, uh, and even if it is, it's, it's hurting us more. So. I guess for the last few years, I've looked at uh, that, that level of anger as a form of trying to control a situation that's not controllable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let go. It, yep. It is. It's, it's just, it's freedom. And luckily one of my spiritual gifts is also mercy. <laughs> so that did help though. Uh, you know, it, it was more than just that. It was more than even just forgiveness. It truly was breaking of chains. Like, yeah, this is, like I said, I just cried because I don't think that I allowed myself to have emotions 
as much as I did that, you know, during that situation, during that instance of asking for forgiveness and forgiving. So it was kind of like it opened up to a dam of all of the tears that I had accumulated in all the years. So um, it was powerful, just really, really breaking free. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've had those moments too. It, it's uh, tough to forgive some of the people who've been the worst offenders, but it's mm-hmm. still possible. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and the other side is so much better. That's kind of <laughs> like, oh my gosh, please forgive somebody, you know, cause it is, it's so much better on the other side. Oh yeah. I started sleeping better. I started eating better. I started craving yeah. healthier foods and wanting exercise. Depression kind of sloughed mm-hmm. off. It was amazing. Oh yeah. That's exactly, you know, we just don't realize how much it impacts. And I think that's the biggest thing. We don't realize how much stuff is hanging on to us until we actually break the chains. And that takes courage because it's scary on the other side. You know, it's, we don't know what's on the other side and it's scary looking at it, but I know once I've been on the other side, it is like, Oh my gosh, what took me so long, you know? And just, (laughs) So I really try to encourage people like, no, really, the other side is phenomenal, you know, and so it's so beautiful. Yeah, (laughs) just letting them know that, yeah, and that people don't have to do it alone. It's like, let's, you have support. There are lots of people, you know, that can, that can support you and that really asking for God to kind of come in and carry you. And that's what he's done that for me so many other times in addition to this, you know. Like my husband fell off of a roof almost four years ago and almost died. And we're actually getting ready to write a book because there were so many miracles that happened in that. And, and it's just amazing. So. And and that was the perfect segue because I was just going to ask you your book called Shedding Lives Living Beyond Childhood Trauma. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Sure. Uh, Yeah. I talk about my journey uh, and you know, give more background of kind of our family and how I grew up and really more in the details of what, how it impacted me and how it impacted my relationships, my health, my, uh, just my self-worth and, and then, uh, you know, how it kind of, how some of the traumas really even chained onto each other, you know, and then how I overcame it. Who were the people that helped me? What did they do? You know, what do I wish would have been done so that, you know, now that I know what, what could have been helpful. Uh, so, and then how it also led me to the work that I do, because I work, I help schools create safe, supportive, and successful environments by, you know, looking at what are, you know, what are all of the things that, that are in place that are, really making it more stressful and how can we get rid of things as well as how can we make sure the administrators, the, the teachers, um, the, the kids all have the skills to cope with difficult challenges and really creating, create, um, creating environments that support positive well-being and, and create, and, and really creating safe environments. Um, I've done a lot of work around you know, with schools out of, let's look at preventing school shootings and preventing um, mental health crises and suicide and bullying and all of those things so that we can actually all grow and have more positive experiences and improve our academics and improve just society in general. So, uh, so I, I talk briefly, you know, kind of about how it led me to that work and then how it also impacted my, you know, how I took my work and my personal experiences. And then, you know, my family, there was a lot of trauma with my husband before I came along and his kids. And so how, you know, I was able to take everything that I learned and really help them so that they can heal and, uh, and then grow from their own experiences to kind of break the chain in our family you know, in, in in my husband's family, as well as my family, because, uh, you know, my nieces and nephews, like I'm just very open and talking about all of it because unless we talk about it, we're never going to, we can't get through it. We have to look at it and bring it to the light so that we can then heal from trauma and move forward. So, 
So that's kind of what the, you know, the book, and I, I, I talk a little bit about my husband's accident and, but that's, that's the next book. <laughs> We're going to be talking <laughs> about how, you know, that God basically was able to use all of the trauma that I've been through and has made me so much stronger. Like I'm just, I'm a person that I couldn't have even imagined I would be, you know, years ago. So it, it's just really empowering. So I try to encourage people to, to, you know, I try to, you know, make safe spaces and help them be vulnerable so that they can then heal. And by me being vulnerable and sharing my story and, uh, and just putting it out there and sharing what I've learned. So it's very cool. I uh, <clears throat> I normally don't admit to this, but I did kind of peruse your book a bit. Um, and I was actually reading the introduction where you talk about your mom and how she lost her mother at such a young age. I mean, this goes into exactly what you were just talking about. You're so open and talking about this, but she and her family didn't ever talk about it. Exactly. You know, yeah. you are changing things for future generations. Yeah. You're making I'm a huge difference. Thanks. That's my goal. Like we can't, cause I understand what trauma does and that it can pass down generations if we don't break those cycles. And so it's so important to do that. Yes, absolutely. So if somebody wants to grab a copy of your book, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at it on Amazon. Are there any other retail locations where they can find your book? So right now we actually have a special until uh, April 16th, it is 99 cents, the ebook though. So Amazon definitely is the, the place to go. Uh, it is, we are going to be expanding, uh, to other places. It, it's, it was really just launched a month ago. So I've been really focusing on Amazon, uh, and, uh, it will be available in other places, hopefully within the next few months. And I'm going to be working on the audio book as well. I want to have all the different formats available. And also you can go to my website. So if you want to keep up with kind of the latest news on it, uh, my website is www.katonalynnconsulting.com and uh, you can sign up. And I have some free resources on there as well and other podcast interviews that I've done. So, and, it, you know, showing how you can also work with me as well. Awesome. And I think that there's probably uh, a few people that I can think of right off the, right off the bat that I'd like to refer to you. Oh, what awesome. you're doing is incredible. And I love that you have a Christian based foundation too. Yeah, this is, it's really important to those of us who do consider ourselves to be Christians, to find people that we can work with who understand our faith. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also really kind of breaking the, the, silos and, and, you know, cause I do work in public schools and I share my story and I've, no one has any issues with it. And so it's, it's kind of breaking these invisible barriers that are between, you know, people that think that, oh, that, you know, they're a Christian that I don't, I don't want to be like them or, you know, they, they're not like me. I don't understand. And so it's, it's really breaking down um, the stigma and, and really, helping people to understand that just we have to talk to each other and really um, create safe space. Yes. Yeah. So how do you celebrate your wins in life when something goes really well? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I definitely like to, you know, my husband and I, we, we're very social and I think, sharing it with other people. Like I love sharing wins with other people, like by helping to build up others. So it, it kind of, it doesn't really sound like it's, it's, you know, my celebration, but it is, it's just, I love kind of giving it away because it's so exciting and I love seeing others do well. Uh, so I try to share it as much as possible. You know, how can I share the things that I've done, you know, that I've, had that have been successful and how can I help others to get to that same place? So that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Lynn, there's always one last question I ask people before I let them go. And it's always my favorite question of the podcast. What is one thing that you love about yourself? that's not related to your physical appearance. Ooh, I, lo I love that. I am merciful. I kind of brought it up earlier. Like that is something that, and, and I always like to see the positive in people, you know, I don't sugarcoat it, 
I just, I love, I look, I look underneath and not just look at their physical outside. I try to look at people on the inside and I think I'm really good at, at seeing that in people, no matter what they look like, you know, whatever their roles are, whatever bad things they've done. I love being able to look at people and seeing who they really are underneath. I love that. That is amazing. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I think you're just such an inspirational person. Uh, you're, you're amazing. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you and uh, I just have uh, enjoyed being on your show. Thank you. Welcome back to season three of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing people who did or planned to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. If that sounds like you, reach out. We can talk about having you on the show, too. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal. You can find the links to either option in the podcast description. As always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking.